It's very great pleasure for me to um, to introduce the keynote lunch panel, um, and and really um, I'll sim simply introduce Anna Maria Tremonti and uh, get her to introduce the members of her panel. Anna Maria Tremonti is very well known to. Um, almost all of us as the uh, host of The Current, um, which uh, airs every day on Radio 1 at the CBC. But uh, Anna Maria Tremonti is in her 10th season, I think, at The Current, but has um, a, a very, very long and um, uh, celebrated career as a journalist in Canada with the Fifth Estate and the National and in various posts uh, across Canada and around the world. And um, uh, I'm very thrilled that she has uh, agreed to come up here to Osgoode Hall and participate in the program. And so, um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Anna Maria and uh, get underway with the lunch panel. Thank you. Okay. Um, hello. I'm going to give you just um, a quick introduction to our panelists and then um, we'll have them talk a little bit about uh, the issues that are before us and um, and then what I would, thought I would do is open it up for questions so we have a discussion ongoing but I will control it so I will ask you to keep your questions um, short and if you have several questions maybe pick one so that we can get lots of people talking and you can always go back just to, so that we can this will be a bit of um this session should end in about 45 minutes so we'd like to hear from as many people as we can uh, which is, of course, 45 minutes longer than I ever get for a discussion on one discussion on the current. So, um, joining me up here this morning, this afternoon, is Sylvia Stead, the associate editor of the Globe and Mail. She's responsible for oversight of editorial legal issues, dealing with public issues from readers and groups such as the Ontario Press Council, managing issues of ethics and journalistic standards. She has held a number of senior positions at the Globe and Mail, including deputy editor, executive editor, national editor, and as national editor, she won the George Brown Award for editing. Next to me is Mark Stevens, who you have been introduced to already today. Um, but to remind you, specializing in international appellate and complex litigation, constitutional human rights, IP, media, and regulatory work, defamation, privacy, media, data protection, and freedom of information and intellectual property. Mark has undertaken some of the highest profile cases in the UK and abroad. He's also active in many other areas, having been appointed by the British Foreign Secretary to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office Free Expression Advisory Board and the British Lord Chancellor to be a champion for the community legal service. And, um, to my right, my colleague at CBC, Lyndon McIntyre, who is the co-host of The Fifth Estate, CBC Television's investigative program. He has been there since 1990. Um, uh, Lyndon has had many jobs at the CBC, uh, the journal, uh, documentary reporter, across really the Middle East, Central America, the USSR, uh, working as well in, in uh, worth mentioning, I think in 1979, when he had a program called the McIntyre File, um, Lyndon successfully initiated a legal action to clarify the right of public access to documentation regarding search warrants. And uh, that case, McIntyre versus the Attorney General of Nova Scotia, was eventually heard by the Supreme Court of Canada and resulted in a landmark decision affirming press freedom and the principle of transparency in the courts. Um, and. Uh, I guess we can begin. Um, welcome to our panelists. And I, I just want to run by you some of the things that maybe we could explore on this panel. We will hear from our panelists in a moment. But when we talk about watching the watchdogs, we want to explore the integrity of the media, public trust in the media, questions of accountability, whether journalists are capable of holding themselves accountable. We'd like to explore the balance between the public's right to know and the potential harm to the public or to individuals, how the media machine operates on deadlines, audience size, and fierce competition, but has to balance that with uh, political motives and uh, more altruistic journalistic motives, um, whether ethical standards and self-regulation work and what role the law can play or should play in regulating the media. There are lots of concrete examples that are swirling around us at this point. The phone hacking scandal, WikiLeaks, the reporting of security issues and the questions of self-censorship around that, um, the handling of leaks from Meher Arar to Judith Miller, um, the pressures from other journalists, 
journalistic bosses, or even a polarized public as you try to cover very touchy issues. Um, and again, in this country, we have war coverage, security leaks, issues on terrorism, all of that play into this discussion of watching the watchdog. Um, and what have we learned, perhaps, that can bring us forward uh, and to maybe help define and hone the integrity of our news organizations? So maybe we could start. Sylvia, why don't you start and sure. talk to us a little bit about what you're thinking about all of this. Sure, I'll just go over briefly some of the questions given the time, but um, the question of who's watching us has changed dramatically um, in the past few years, and not just who's watching, but who's commenting, who's holding us to account. So we've gone in the newspaper business from a very limited number of letters to the editor to now we have thousands of conversations online, we have bloggers who critique, we have special interest groups, we have campaigns that go viral if we've made a mistake or have been seen to have any kind of a bias on stories. Yesterday we had an amusing little story written in the Daily Telegraph about us um, suggesting that a caption writer on a celebrity photo gallery had gone rogue. And he hadn't. He was just having a little fun. And these are not, of course, watchdog type public interest issues, but it does talk about the reach, that anything we do is not just a Canadian issue, it becomes a global issue. So how are we held accountable? I mean, the most important thing for us is our readers hold us accountable because our credibility is absolutely crucial. We have to have that trust with the readers. The next most important thing is internal, as Anna Maria talked about, and that is our internal code, and like most major media organizations, we do have a code of conduct. It is aspirational. It uh, suggests in broad terms how people should behave, that they should have balance in their stories, that quotations should be real, that there should be civility. Um, and the other important thing there is editors. And like any good lawyer, your editor will save a reporter from a story. A, a good editor will question, will challenge, uh, will make the reporter go back and do more work on it. So there is, in any of the big organizations, quite a good infrastructure around these stories. So this is not one person writing it. There are checks and balances within it. Um, there are corrections, too, if this uh, goes awry, and we don't hesitate to do corrections. There's also that some of my friends are here from the Ontario Press Council, who also give voice to people who are frustrated, generally by bias, sometimes also with fact. And it is a group of people who are both public and media who will rule on it. When they feel we have done something wrong, we have to publish that. And uh, we accept that that's another one of the checks and balances. The courts, of course, are the ultimate balance, and as discussed in the previous panel, the new rules on responsible journalism are ideal for us. They're really much stronger than the old rules used to be because it's basically what we want. We want to be able to write fair and balanced stories in the public interest and not, as Harvey said, be caught up on whether every single fact is right and provable, but is it in the public interest and have we been fair? Um, if I can be allowed just a slight tangent here, Anna Maria, talking to a group of lawyers. So as journalists, um, I think it's key that we do things as Lyndon has done, that the Globe and Mail did in the Daniel LeBlanc case on sponsorship. There are a lot of points at which it's important for the media to take a stand in terms of changing the law, we should not be having to take so many stands over publication bans, which are far too automatic in this country, and should not have to be fought day after day after day. Um, so basically, the, the last question was, uh, I think, what have we learned from some of the cases recently? News of the world phone hacking uh, example being one of the most interesting ones. And a few things I'd like to just throw out a bit in terms of questions. One is, maybe Mark can answer this, why did it take so long for this to be uncovered? Because sitting from afar, it seems like it was 
uh, not a hidden story. It seemed as if it should have been obvious that there was phone hacking going on, otherwise how could you know this? Um, the other thing I think you need to, we need to understand is that for the public trust, the media not only has to be accurate, but has to be fair to people, and that, I think that's clearly where the news of the world fell down. The other interesting part of it is the culture that allowed this to happen in London and in the news of the world, and I think it is a culture that you would not see happening here for a variety of reasons. And um, maybe I'll throw that to Mark again and say, do you think that's a fair comment? Well, Mark, go ahead. <laughs> you always feel that you've been brought in for a reason, don't you? <laughs> um, I'd like to start off in a slightly different place. Uh, that's not to say that I won't answer the question. I will, but just in my own order, if I may. Um, I think that Sylvia's right. We do have a bond of honesty and candor between our journalists and the public. And that, that bond of honesty and candor is policed in a number of different ways. We all enter into a covenant where we allow the government to have secrets from us so that they may better rule in our interests. And that brings you to the question of what is the role of the media in intermediating and policing that particular covenant. And the answer to that, in my view, is that the media has an obligation to keep the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the government honest. Uh, they should keep only the number of secrets that they need. And indeed, uh, the head of MI6 uh, said at Cambridge recently, that's Judy Dench, to those of you not quite so familiar with uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, way in which our security services worked, uh, 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 from the James Bond movies. Um, Judy Dench uh, said uh, in his real incarnation, uh, the government don't need uh, that many secrets. And I would respectfully concur with that, and I would add to it and say they don't need as many secrets, and they don't need them for as long as necessary. And I think we should look at that too. And that brings me to the question of things like WikiLeaks and the Pentagon Papers, and that's part of uh, the expectation that some classified information will come into the hands of journalists, and journalists will publish that, as long as it can be published safely and responsibly. Um, going to the question of hacking, I mean, yeah, there was, uh, a fairly widespread understanding that this wasn't uh, uh, that this was going on. I think that it's fair to say, and it's not a popular thing to say, but I think it's fair to say that Murdoch has had a, a, an unfair rub in this because he was the one guy that got caught, whereas everybody else was doing it, and they didn't come up with the notebooks. And so I think that that's slightly unfortunate. But I think there's also a question, a moral dilemma, which I'd like to throw back at you, Sylvia which is this, that you, know, you opened yourself okay. up to it. Um, the, the, there's, a, there's a serious question here, which is, you know, the thing that made this all um, blow up in the UK was not that, you know, a couple of uh, celebrities had their voicemails listened to by journalists. Nobody really cared about that in the UK, and that's why nothing actually happened about it, because nobody cared, and you know the stories in the newspapers, uh, all of the tabloids, were pretty good as a result, uh, pretty accurate, um, as they would be. Um, and the issue came up when uh, a schoolgirl called Millie Dowler uh, was uh, abducted and killed, and she had her voicemail hacked, at a time which led to um, some people wrongly believing that she was alive because voicemails were disappearing from her, uh, her message bank. And the question, and, and there was outrage at that, but I would put back and suggest to you that if that were the other way round and that Millie Dowler had perhaps had a paedophile parent and had run away from home and that the journalist through hacking had brought that child in from an abusive parent, that we would actually perhaps be looking at that case with a completely different pair of spectacles than we are at the moment. And there are, I think, cases where an invasion of privacy is warranted. It has to be proportionate, and it has to be, I think, the only method of gathering the information. But I, I would give you an example. 
Um, there was uh, a, a, a prison governor who was uh, caught out um, trading uh, sexual services uh, for uh, privileges, um, and he was caught by the news of the world as a result of hacking. It was the only way to gather that story, and I would say that that was in the public interest, and they was, it was justified. Um, I think you know one can look at other decisions and other issues around that, but I do think that there are real issues around the banning of, 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 uh, of hacking. I think you have to think about the process. And if you go to uh, television, uh, I think that one of the issues that comes out of that, certainly in the UK, we have a position where if you're going to invade somebody's privacy, then you have to be sure that you're going to expose criminality or some serious wrongdoing. And there has to be no other way that you can gather that information. And provided that that is sanctioned by, at a high level, editorial uh, check and balance, you can record that and invade somebody's privacy. You then review the material and say, have I got anything here which proves the criminality or serious wrongdoing? And that, uh, only then do you make the second decision about whether or not to broadcast. That seems to me to be an appropriate and proportionate response. But I think if we start making all investigative journalism or making, making us uh, jump through too many hoops or criminalizing investigative journalism all the way across the board, we really are making a rod for our own back. Lyndon McIntyre. <coughs> well, secrecy is one of those uh, virtues that uh, is more observed in the abuse of it than uh, in the support of it, and I, I agree that uh, secrecy as a barrier to legitimate transparency is a bit overworked, especially by people in power. And I believe that, <clears throat> like many uh, of the values that we hold important in society and in life, uh, the legitimacy of the violation, or the legitimacy of the value lies in part, in a large part, in, in the motivation behind it. And that sort of takes me to a, a kind of a general, maybe old-fashioned platonic notion I've always had that the ethical quality of journalism uh, has always reflected the character, skill, and motivation of particular journalists in particular situations. And the need uh, which I believe in for standards and professional guidelines and laws arises from the harsh reality uh, that people outside the media will attempt to promote private interests by misleading and manipulating the media in order to mislead and manipulate the public. And sometimes we uh, in the media have to be protected against uh, the deliberate manipulation that we can be exposed to. Journalists uh, promoting personal interests, whether it be lifestyle, career, or celebrity, will find ways uh, left on their own to evade rigorous adherence to the ideals that, in, at the end of the day, the ideals make our jobs more difficult. To be fair, to be accurate, it takes work. And above all this, we have the journalistic institutions that download ethical responsibility to indiv individuals and in the professions, uh, while making clear the paramount importance as, as they stress with us too, the guidelines Sylvia mentioned and, 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 the, and the penalties we will all face if we, if we violate the guidelines, uh, they will also, out of the other side of their heads, uh, make it perfectly clear that the paramount importance uh, in our lives is institutional stability, commercial viability, uh, which usually benefits from what is popular, sensational, and influential, even when it's wrong. So, on the whole, looking at this profession historically, uh, there has been an awful lot of room for misadventure in the media, and it's been reassuring to me uh, as one who has been in it for almost, I hesitate to say, half a century. Uh, it's, a, it's reassuring to me that we haven't seen a lot more lies and mistakes than we have seen. <clears throat> and I have to attribute that to two realities. I think the institutional lip service paid to moral integrity has been taken sufficiently seriously by a sufficient number of people in leadership positions to give it some practical force on the ground. And I also find myself 
led with some reluctance to the view that, by and large, a sufficient number of people go into the profession of the, the various professions of journalism and the media uh, with enough idealism to sustain a feeling of personal responsibility that does serve to restrain us from doing damage to society over the long haul. In the end, as I said before, the quality of, of journalism and the quality of ethical behavior boils down to character and instinct and the freedom of the individual reporter to do the right thing as he or she sees fit as a servant of the public, dedicated to the public good, which is how we derive our legitimacy in the long run. And if there's something that we should be worried about today, and particularly at this panel, it begins with the fact that the functions of the journalistic media have become increasingly subsidiary within a hierarchy of interests that define the corporate structures that now control the public media. And that increasingly the value of the public media is being assessed by criteria alien to the notion of public service. We're now in a perilous position where the influence of the individual and his or her personal commitment to some degree and quality of ethical conduct are vulnerable to monolithic corporate ideology driven by wealth and political influence of unprecedented menace, certainly in any democratic context. And I'll be a bit disappointed if we don't address here today the subject of the corporate menace and where it originates and perhaps some of its particular exponents in the global Murdoch em empire and in its pale and pathetic duplicates in Canada. Well, why don't we start there? <laughs> um, and I'm going to get you to, to say more about that. What we see uh, in some of the more outrageous media controversies that uh, have taken public attention lately is a certain homogeneity in behavior uh, homogeneity, a sort of a monolithic character in, in how individuals are in, across the board in various companies and various countries seem to react in the same way to, to particular challenges. And uh, my suspicion is that it's driven by a fundamental loss of a sense of personal independence by people who actually write the stories and put them on television or in the papers or on the radio. And, uh, and this is being driven by some osmosis, I guess, where we are persuaded that uh, the, the well-being of a large corporate enterprise translates into our personal well-being, and our personal well-being and the, the well-being of the corporate enterprise transcends the interests of the public. And uh, that, to me, is a, 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 a breakdown of major uh, proportions in the long-standing uh, relationship of trust that has existed between people in the mass media and the people who read us and listen to us and watch us. Mark Stevens. I just think that's um, so yesterday. Um, you know, Lyndon, large corporations were something that I was studying when I was at university 35, six, 36 years ago. And the reality is that the corporatist world isn't the big bogeyman that you know, people think it is. We now have a fractured, diffuse media. We all have access to information in much more uh, vibrant ways. And I think as a result of that, um, the suggestion that um, we're getting uh, some kind of parallel between information flow from large corporations and uh, this, this diaspora of information that we otherwise get is just wrong. I mean, I get information from so many different sources. I make up my own mind about the issues of moment of the day, and I then move forward. And that's how I gather my information. And I think that certainly anyone who's in a generation beneath me does that. Sylvia. I would say that, uh, in fact, I think the greater danger to journalism right now is the fact that 
So much news is commoditized. So much news is the same thing you read everywhere else. You get uh, websites that uh, are pulling together stories from other places. And in fact, what you're getting is less original journalism. And um, I don't mean the CBC by that because the CBC does a lot. I don't mean the Globe and Mail, I don't mean the Toronto Star, but beyond the big organizations. Um, we had someone talk today about, uh, I think it was Dominique, who said there was one journalist, by, by which I presume she means one reporter, per community paper. So how much original journalism is being done anymore? Well, I think there's, there is a real issue about the resource which is available, which goes back to an issue about funding and all sorts of other issues, but we're also able to gather information from so many other places. I and mean, if you go back um, 15, 20 years, we had sort of monopolistic uh, media in particular geographic locations. We don't have that anymore. We get, we're able to access information. Uh, I follow for reasons of my own uh, private grief, which you don't need to intrude upon, uh, Malaysian media quite closely. And as a result of that, I'm able to follow, you know, eight to 14 different media outlets in Malaysia and get a very interesting overview of, of the media in that country. Well, I think it might be easier to be optimistic uh, <clears throat> if you're sitting at this table or if you happen to be in a position to, uh, with, uh, you know, with some uh, intelligence and uh, discernment take advantage of all the available sources that are available out there. Uh, but I think that there are two overarching realities, one being that, the, that the, the resources available for the professional practice of journalism are diminishing, mm -hmm. and the uh, ability of large self-interested organizations, whether they be government organizations or corporations, uh, to uh, shape and deliver <clears throat> messages that are designed and transmitted for the benefits of these groups is, is unprecedented. In this country, we have a propaganda machine uh, that uh, in my lifetime, I've, ne I've never seen the like of it in Canada. The, the government of Canada has taken charge of the information that comes out of the public sector and they shape it and they deliver it and, uh, and on the other side of the coin they attempt with a certain amount of success to shut down the, the traditional access uh, that journalists have to, to information and I believe that it creates an insidious situation that is not mitigated to my satisfaction by the availability of a lot of blogs and, and uh, tweeters and um, uh, Google uh, uh, outlets. But, but I think that you've got the, the, the social development, uh, which you have to acknowledge. And the social development, uh, Lyndon, I think, that responds to what you're talking about is an organization like WikiLeaks. Um, that's another organization, I would argue a journalistic organization, who actually put further information into the public domain. Um, and it's doing it in a way which responds to uh, modern needs. I mean, the, ge the genius of Julian Assange, if you like, was to recognize that, you know, investigative journalists like you, who used to receive a couple of dog-eared photocopiers as their source documents, are now getting CDs full of material, and that needs to be uh, mashed up, it needs to be indexed, it needs to be searchable, and you need, you need, you need journalists to go through it, people with experience to, to go through it and see what the information in there is. Uh, and he managed to do that on an international scale uh, through the uh, development of WikiLeaks because he recognized that information came in data and so he just peels off the uh, identifying features. So he doesn't know who sends him uh, material on any subject. And that has led to uh, the burgeoning. We've seen the Wall Street Journal set up their own data dump of a similar kind. We've seen, for example, similar wiki organizations set up in the UK uh, for pilots who don't wish to identify which airline they fly for, uh, lest they have re retrib retributions, but they have their own um, place where they can lo go and log concerns. Um, you've got health and safety in relation to the National Health Service. You've got others coming out of British Rail. And so you've got all of these things which are social uh, responses 
uh, to the, the problems that you, you correctly identify. I think the challenge is actually where are the journalists going to get, get hold of that data and analyze it for us? Because what I'm prepared to pay for uh, is I want an experienced, dispassionate, objective journalist to go through that data and pull out the information for me. I mean, we've seen well, the development of crowdsourcing. You put your finger on a problem that, that we in the business encounter all the time when we talk to people who want to be journalists, people who, who, are, who are driven by a sense of, of the legitimacy of the profession and the need for a public-spirited approach to information. Where do they get the jobs? Where do they get the training? And, and they fall back on the need to uh, create their own media. And maybe in, in my grandchildren's lifetime, these new media will have blossomed into something substantial. But there's going to be a, 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 a very perilous period of time in which this social media, this burgeoning new technology is not sufficient to overcome the forces that are pushing the traditional media off of the stage and taking over with propaganda and manipulation. Mm -hmm. And in part because they aren't organized and they do not have the time and the skills to go through the data dump. I mean, that is a very rare skill even within organized journalism. And those are the people who really make a difference in terms of public service work. Yeah. I, I think uh, if I can, we should uh, open this up to the audience as we continue um, with this. If you have a question, microphones are there. Um, if you go to the microphone, someone here will wait for you to go first. Give us your name, please, and uh, go ahead. Hello. Um, my name's Naomi. <clears throat> Sorry. Bless you. It's, it's not so much a um, question as kind of a comment. Um, I'm here as an intern for um, Journalists for Human Rights. I'm not being paid for my internship, um, but that's where I'm getting my training. So going back to something that was talked about at the first panel is, you know, how can we fund young journalists? And then the other thing I think that, we're, that Mark is missing is that while there are all of these great venues available online to follow news in Malaysia or anything else, a lot of people in my age group they're not going and looking for those things. They are just completely drowned by advertising on Facebook, following the Britney Spears feed, whatever's going on that's promoted by the radio. So that comes back to Lyndon's point of there's so much corporate everything going on. So I guess, like this is talking about who's watching the media, but do you feel that media now has a role to try and instill a kind of literacy on the public? And how would you imagine that happening? Who wants to take that? I didn't get there, but... One of the disadvantages of having been in the media listening to people for as long as I have is that you lose the ability to hear things clearly. Could you just repeat the, <laughs> the, the question in the I statement? Guess, I guess my question is, um, how do we, like, do you feel that the media has a role to uh, instill a sort of engagement or literacy on the public in order to um, actually create a need for the media at this point because people my age are not actually looking for news they're just following whatever corporate whatever PR is putting out onto the Twitter sphere or whatever else so do you feel that media would have a role to help with literacy and if so what would that look like do you think that's a possibility I think the media, <clears throat> the media as, an, as, as a lot of in different institutions, private and public, uh, does have an absolute responsibility to uh, nurture people who will fill these important public service roles. Whether you work for Fox News or the BBC or the CBC, you are a public servant, in my opinion. And your first uh, responsibility is to the public that reads you and not to the unit manager that ha you happen to be accountable to uh, financially. So and the problem is that the traditional media nowadays barely has the resources to get the papers out and to get the show on. And uh, this notion of outreach into, into another generation to help bring them along, to help to, to, to feed its, 
It's, uh, it's just a luxury that uh, most places can't afford. One of the things that kills me is uh, the number of young people that are working for nothing in newsrooms across this country. I feel guilty every time I walk into our place and I see another intern. What's an intern? Were you an intern? I was a student that got paid $65 a week, <laughs> which was a lot of money in the 60s. But, uh, well, maybe we, don't, maybe we have a system that doesn't work. Why do we need interns? Why don't we just tell people to go and try to work? Well, like, because, because we now say that unless you've been an intern, you can't have a job. I was never an intern. Well, uh, the, that, like the, the idea that we put too much no on internships. There are no entry-level jobs, Anna Maria. I mean, but that's where that's where we maybe have to change the way we do our journalism. Yeah. And I say to young journalists, take your journalism back, take it back, start so asking mean, tougher what questions. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, don't I, don't work you know, for nothing. But if you don't work for nothing, you don't work, and you don't get the first line on your resume. And. Uh, you worked on the 50 watt radio station. In I did, Nova yeah. Scotia. But well, but, we're, uh, we're we're getting off topic okay. for this this yeah. thing here. I, I don't. Do you, do you, is it the job of the media to make people media literate? You know, I think there's a responsibility on behalf of the readers too. The the media has not stopped doing the public interest stories, and um, I think there's a degree to which younger people. Um, are more interested in stories about their own lives, perhaps, and perhaps it's a question of maturity. But I think there's a responsibility on the part of people at universities to be talking about issues, to be pointing to things in the news as a, as a way of having those discussions. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, literacy is... Uh, uh, it, 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 we're in a period of change in society, and when you're in a period of change, it's very difficult to say, okay, well, it, we, we, this is all fine. But the reality is that society, I trust, will uh, evolve in a way which allows people to be literate. Uh, I think that if you've got intellectually curious people, and I'm sure there are some young people who are in, still intellectually curious, that they will become literate. Mm -hmm. And that skill will be passed from generation to generation. So I have, I have un undying faith. Mm -hmm. Next question. Um, <coughs> there's been uh, at least something written, I think John Honrich has written about some media here in Canada opting out of press councils and national journalism associations. And it appears to be there's some decisions by some media to just say we're not going to play by the same rules that other people are, uh, alleging certain political stifling and, and, and lacking their freedom to do so. So I'd be interested in, you've got someone from the C CBC and someone from the Globe and Mail here, I'd be interested in your response to that. Do, do you find that that is sort of a, what what should what should the public's response to that be? Should it be to say that if you don't play by certain journalistic standards, then we don't participate if you ask us questions? Or should it be to say we will still uh, participate with you, but the quality of the piece that comes out of the other end has no accreditation, it has no credibility, or it may not have the same standards that someone who is participating in a press council, someone who is participating in uh, a journalism association does. I mean, I don't believe that it should be mandatory, if that's what you're suggesting, to be a member of the press council. I think it's useful for us. Um, sometimes, frankly, I'm annoyed at the decisions that come out. Sometimes I think they're absolutely right. But it is a good thing to say to readers who object and they say a certain columnist has a bias. You can say you don't have to go to court. You can go to an independent body and it is a venue that we can have that discussion with readers. That's our choice, we make that choice. You know, as a, as a journalist, I don't believe in forcing people to do anything. I believe in you know, free choice and companies will make their own choice and they'll be judged or not on that. Sorry, just a quick follow. I was never, I was never suggesting that it'd be mandatory. My, my question was more along the lines of, um, how are we supposed to, how are we supposed to judge the quality of the product if there's no if people are opting out of even voluntary peer recognition groups that was, that was my point yeah i mean there still are many many other ways uh, to do it that um, other papers that are not members of the press council will still have 
fairly open letters to the editor that will be critical of them. They'll certainly have thousands of comments on their stories online that may well be critical of them. So I, I don't think it stops it. Go ahead. Yes, um, my uh, question was in response to, I guess, Lyndon's comments about the monolithic nature of, of the media, you know, the, the mainstream media and that's buying into uh, state propaganda and the homogeneous nature of their product. And um, just sort of um, in response to that, um, you know, there's a fairly well-known phenomenon that Kat Sunstein referred to about the blogosphere producing a lot of polarization in, uh, in a public debate. He talks about what he calls the echo chamber of the um, blogosphere where people sort themselves into deliberative enclaves where they associate <clears throat> with other like-minded people and just basically uh, repeat and intensify each other's views with a resulting sort of fragmentation of public opinion. I'm wondering whether or not um, the role of the mainstream media could really be to counteract that and to really take advantage of uh, you know, its homogeneous nature to some extent. Um, perhaps um, you know, like it was in the 1960s when we had three major media outlets that sort of adopted a whole broad consensus of public opinion um, as a countervailing influence to this fractionization that occurs within the blogosphere that uh, Cass Sunstein uh, described. Um, you, want, you want to boil that down for Linda? <coughs> you can. Well, no, because I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure what you're saying. You're saying, should we go back to the, the times when I'm not sure I, well, I'm, I'm as the moderator, I'm not going to have an opinion, okay. but you seem to be suggesting that at, there was a time when three media outlets all agreed on the same kind of coverage, uh, and I'm should we go that, back to that time, but I don't know if that's what you're really saying. Well, I, what I'm suggesting is that maybe um, there is some value added in, in the homogeneous nature of, of the mainstream media as a way of <clears throat> counterbalancing the fractionization of opinion that occurs uh, in the blogosphere and that uh, maybe this homogeneity that you've identified, Lyndon, is not necessarily all that bad. Maybe there's some value added that in that uh, quality that can be brought to bear to counteract the fractionalization that occurs within the blogosphere because of uh, the echo chamber effect. Well, I, I think you're saying that, that maybe it's not a bad thing that there is a kind of a unifying uh, factor. Yeah. And, uh, and it depends, I guess, what the factor is. If the factor is some sort of a, of a uh, particular interest, or if the factor, uh, if, if, a, if a bunch of journalists looking at the same story are motivated by their career path, as opposed to what is happening, or if they're motivated by some imperative that they have absorbed from their bosses, and that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, I don't recall that there was ever uh, homogeneity in the past where you had, I mean, if you just t take the Toronto media scene, uh, you could read three newspapers and have to figure out the common denominators that uh, told you what the story was. Uh, I, uh, I guess everything has to depend on, you know, the quality, the, the outcome has to depend on just what's driving it in the first place. And, and I, I get concerned, let me give you a specific example, and it's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's one that uh, gets under our skin at the CBC a lot. Uh, the new Sun Media uh, phenomenon, Kuwait and company here, uh, insists on referring to the CBC as a state broadcaster. Now, I know a lot of the people who, uh, who uh, work for Sun, the various Sun media, and I know that they know the difference between a public broadcaster and a state broadcaster. And I ask myself, how come it is uniformly now a cultural practice within that large empire that starts with Quebec Hoare and Pierre Carl Pelladeau? What is it that has created this uh, this vernacular, that we are a state broadcaster. Did they all wake up one morning and have the same inspiration uh, with their breakfast cereal? Or is it something they have observed from a corporate culture in whose interest it is to remove the public broadcaster from the media scene in Canada? And who are, des who are aggressively out to do so by a whole lot of, of tactics that are now in full force. So, I mean, if if, if we were a state broadcaster and everybody started calling us a state broadcaster, because we were, that's a good thing. If we are suddenly being called to our detriment 
because it will seep into public consciousness. If we are being called a state broadcaster because a large corporate manager in Quebec wants to stamp out public broadcasting in Canada, that's a bad thing. So you have to go back to like, where, where is all this crap coming from and uh, what's behind it and what are the interests being served by it to evaluate whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. That's an example of corporate Is that propaganda. kind of <laughs> off topic? <laughs> <laughs> we'll do our next question. Next question, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Matthew Davies. I'm a I'll get you to speak up, please. My name is Matthew Davies. I'm a media liability underwriter. Um, first question is, uh, Lyndon has talked about the lack of resources in order to get the news out on time, yet Sylvia talked about the checks and balances and having the resources of, you know, fact checkers and uh, editorial, -checkers. editorial staff and yeah. people who review and do things before things go to press. Mm -hmm. How do you account for the fact that the, if someone tweets something that is erroneous but the other guy picks it up and runs with it, that the mainstream press follows that trend? I'm thinking about bed bugs at the Toronto International Film Festival or the erroneous reporting of certain celebrities dying when in fact they're still alive but the mainstream media picks up and runs with it. Some do, some didn't. We did not report on Gordon Lightfoot's death. Um, at the time, we checked it out first. We called him. So I think that's basic journalism. You see something on Twitter, and to me, that's a tip. The giveaway was he answered the phone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a start. There are, uh, you know, you're right to say, though, that there are things that go up without the same checks and balances online that they do in the newspaper, that there are blogs that are not as carefully watched, there are updates on stories online that may have to be overwritten, but the technology allows you to, when you're writing online, be quicker and therefore check things as you go along. You might say someone is 21 when they're really 25. You can fix that five minutes later. The more serious things, though, especially the major investigative things in the public interest, do go through, not fact-checking, that's, um, that's a magazine structure, not a newspaper structure, but they do go through editors and, at times, lawyers. Hey, there was a case where uh, Prime Minister, there was a tweet that Prime Minister Harper had been taken to hospital. It was actually from, it said, the, I, I, like a party person and uh, not as opposed to the PMO, which why would a party person be giving out the information? It was retweeted by a cabinet minister and then it was retweeted by somebody at CBC and that absolutely is a fair question. I, we do have to be careful and um, you're right, it's a tip. Or, or they do the other thing, they go, well, we'll call the people to refute it, which is just as bad because it was never true. Mm -hmm. uh, just a follow on, with the instantaneous ability now of people to comment on news stories on, on the web, what, inf what influence does that have? Because before you'd have to wait to get reaction in the old days by letters to the editor, mm -hmm. outrageous story you, you, you wrote or whatever. Mm -hmm. To what extent now are the uh, ability of the public to give you feedback immediately have any influence at all on what you do next? Well, if you see people writing in that you have something wrong, for example, you'll go back and check it. If you see uh, that the story has gone uh, viral in a way and you get all of a sudden thousands of responses to a story, what you understand as an editor is that this is hot and maybe you should do a follow on it and maybe you should keep it going. But those conversations are much freer than the letters to the editor. They're ruder, they're, you know, anonymous. Some of them are quite questionable. We do have um, a way in which you can alert an editor and those things are taken off if they um, break any of our standards on it. But it does give us insight into uh, what we've done. I'm going to um, do moderator's prerogative here and ask the next question, which is right in line with that, that I'd like to hear from all of you. And that is, when we talk about uh, the, the watchdogs and how we respond to the public, I want to know how you deal with things when, um, how you have the courage to move forward on stories that the public might not like. Because people can, lawyers can write ahead of time. People start writing us at the current before it's even gone to air. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, people can, 
can give you all sorts of email campaigns or they can threaten because they don't like what you're doing, but you believe, you, I mean, you've been through this with WikiLeaks. They don't like what you're doing, so they want you to stop, but you believe that what you're doing is important. And even other journalists who, um, the, the journalists that I call the status quo journalists, and there are tons of them out there, uh, either other, even other journalists will attack you for following a story that really matters, that has to go public at some point. Mm -hmm. How do you fight that? And how do, you, how do you still respond to your responsibilities without caving to the interests of people who would shut you down? Well, to, at the risk of being simplistic, I think you have to, you generally know where it's coming from, and you generally know why it's coming. And, uh, and there are hot button uh, areas that are always going to uh, create a, uh, an attempt at prior restraint. Sometimes the prior restraint comes in uh, threatening uh, gestures in the parking lot. Sometimes uh, it comes uh, w in the form of threatened uh, legal injunctions. Sometimes in less favored civilizations than ours, it comes within the form of a bullet in the back of your head. And, uh, and I do believe that, uh, that these attempts to prior, to, to restrain the publication or the broadcast have to be looked at for legitimacy, but at the end of the day, you'll do what's right. Mark, do you want to speak to this? Because obviously WikiLeaks came under fire from everyone, from government officials around the globe to, well, everybody. It was, a very, it was a very interesting uh, process, actually, because it became clear that they were going to release the cables, um, and there were a number of bits of disinformation put out. First was that uh, the State Department went into overdrive and said that they were about to dump unredacted uh, a whole load of 275,000 cables on the internet uh, and that would endanger lives. Uh, they went to people who might be regarded as the natural supporters of free speech, um, uh, human rights organizations, and they said to human rights organizations, oh, you may not know this, but uh, in the cables, uh, we quote a number of your human rights activists, and of course, when they dump this unredacted onto the internet, then they're going to be in danger. Uh, and so that led to uh, the next process. But of course, the reality was, it was always intended that there should be a careful redactions process. And that process went, went on, and in fact, I think uh, only about 12% of the cables were actually released because of the redaction, the careful redactions process. It was only once it was clear that the information was out there that they were put out unredacted. Uh, so I think that that was quite interesting. And I, I think that, you know, um, there was sort of a practical dilemma. I mean, many people will remember, um, you know, Hillary Clinton, she had a pretty bad weekend. She had to ring a number of uh, uh, foreign countries and said we've said some pretty nasty things about you and our cables we're terribly sorry uh, and I think the French had it about right when they said to her well you should see what we say about you in our cables um, always rely on the French to get it right um, and so I thought that that was that was, uh, that was quite useful really but it, you know I think you have to have the courage of your convictions to go go forward and I think that's the you know it's if you like, the modern development has been WikiLeaks, which is studiedly stateless. Uh, it's inchoate in many different ways, which finds it very, very difficult for uh, the legal system to get its arms around it. You know, if you get, I mean, one of the processes that was really interesting in it was that they were very worried in London that they would get, that there would be an injunction against the release of the, and the publication of the cables. So that meant necess of necessity that the New York Times had to be brought in because it was clear that the advantage under American law and the Supreme Court decision in the Pentagon Papers case was that they wouldn't be able to get a prior restraint. And so once you'd got it clear that it was going into a country where it would also be on the web, uh, which couldn't have prior restraint, prior restraint became uh, inappropriate at those circumstances. So you've got the media taking a very tough and interesting line and building alliances, forging alliances to get the information out there. Sylvia, mm -hmm. um, maybe you can speak yeah. to this. As I'm thinking of the Globe and Mail, specifically a lot of the breaking news on prisoner abuse allegations in Afghanistan came yes. from your reporters and not everybody liked what you were putting in that paper. No, they didn't. And um, 
you have a responsibility to have the courage of your convictions, as Mark says. If you believe the story's right, you've done the due diligence on the story. You also have a responsibility if you get new information at the 11th hour from someone that says, wait a minute, what you're about to write, and, and I'm not talking about this case because it didn't happen in this case, uh, but you do have a responsibility to stop and consider that. You also have to consider the source. Is it a special interest group? Is it someone who feels they've been wronged? And you want to plan and consider how to respond in that, but it doesn't stop you from doing the stories that you have faith in and you have confidence in. And I think that one of the cr critical things is that sources always have motives. And really, you've got to understand what your yeah. source's motive is, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that you should adopt the motive or indeed do anything other than to report objectively the information that you're given. Mm -hmm. You're given information and data, and you, mm -hmm. you report it as best you can. We could go on, but we can't. We're out of time, and the next panel awaits. But thank you, all of you, for taking part in this. That, um, called time on this panel, but we are a little behind schedule, and I'm very aware it's uh, Friday afternoon, and there will be flights that have to be caught later on. So um, I'm just going to invite uh, those who are participating on the uh, confidential sources panel forward. And while they're coming forward, I just want to express our, express our appreciation once again to Anna Maria, uh, Lyndon, Sylvia, and Mark for their lunchtime discussion. So thanks once again, and uh, we'll proceed to the next panel.